Uh, good morning, church family. It's good to see you again today. It's good to be in God's house, ready to worship Him, and got a couple of announcements for you as we get started today. So <clears throat> a number of these things are just kind of upcoming events, but also some important things just to be aware of. And the very first thing, with uh, heavy hearts, I kind of come to you letting you know that one of our missionary families has lost a loved one. Um, you may know Ben and Vicki Ward, uh, missionaries to Togo in Africa. Uh, Vicki has lost her sister in a car accident recently, and so we just want to remember her and the family in prayer, and if you can, just yourself keep them in prayer as well. If you'd like a little bit more information about them as missionaries, we, we have information about them out in the front hallway with, with different pam pamphlets and things like that, or you could talk to me and I could pass along their newsletter if you'd like to get it. Uh, but just keep uh, Vicki Ward in your prayers. Uh, a couple of things coming up in our schedule as a church uh, the YFC Dickens Christmas Craft Show is on uh, September, uh, sorry, not September, I don't know why I said September, wow, <laughs> that's, that's really a long ways away, that's not, that's not the kind of thing we're announcing at this point, point. Uh, and no, the, the, the craft show is on in December, December, December 2nd and 3rd, that's a Saturday and Sunday, and it's $5 admissions, and the proceeds all go towards Youth for Christ here in Norfolk. So I encourage you to take part in that if you can, as I know many of you do. And um, <clears throat> on the topic of YFC, we have our Super Sunday lunch coming up on November the 26th, so a couple weeks away now. And again, all of the proceeds we end up raising for that go towards Anna DeReich, our local YFC missionary here at WCC. Um, Want to make you aware of our Christmas hamper project, which is, again, coming up very, very soon. Um, at this point in time, we're just asking that you keep it in your mind, uh, we, we may have a list of food items for you to look at, the front and back hallway. If you're able <clears throat> to help donate some of those food items, please bring them in. And uh, we're asking that you bring them in and put them into the, the kind of empty, renovated room in the back here, which is kind of potentially going to be a new kitchen one day. But it's this empty, kind of renovated room in the, in the hallway, uh, kind of back behind the uh, auditorium here. And so if you could bring those food items in, if you feel so led to do so, you can uh, help us out that way. The other way to help with our Christmas hamper is to uh, sponsor a family uh, to buy Christmas gifts for the kids that are in that family. So if that's something you'd be interested in doing, as I know many of you do each year, uh, please talk to me afterwards and we can sign you up to have you sponsor a family that way. Uh, a couple of, couple of last things here. Uh, we want to say, because um, they're both here this morning and I'll embarrass them a little bit if I can, a big congratulations to Karina and Daniel. They're both here this morning. So, uh, they've, they've recently been engaged to be married, and so we're super excited for them as the family and the church family as well. So congratulations to both of you. Um, and then, uh, again, as many of you are aware, we've just kind of gone through Remembrance Day, and uh, Wendy and I had a bit of a challenge to figure out when should we kind of do a, a moment of silence for Remembrance Day. Last Sunday seemed so far away since it was on Saturday yesterday. Uh, so we decided to do it today, even though it's a little bit irregular maybe to do it after Remembrance Day. We're still going to do that this morning. And so um, we're going to play the last post, have a moment of silence, and then I'll pray and open up our service and worship. But if you're able, please stand with us. And we are going to just uh, observe a moment of silence for those who have gone before us, for the many lives that have been lost in conflicts and wars in the past, and for those who are even currently serving. We just uh, want to thank God that He has provided us with security and freedoms uh, that not every country gets to enjoy, of course, and that we can look to those great sacrifices that have been made for us and how they point us ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, greater love is no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so, we remember that great sacrifice on a, on a day like Remembrance Day, and we also think of the person of Jesus Christ and, of course, the great sacrifice he made. So at this time, we'll take a moment to be in silence, and then we'll have the last post play as well.
Well, Father in heaven, as we bow before you this morning and open up our time of corporate worship to you, we thank you, Father, for the great sacrifice that was given to us through your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that others have taken it upon themselves to follow in his footsteps, even if they didn't know it, Lord, and sacrificing their lives for us. We thank you for the many who have gone to serve uh, the freedoms of this country and to fight and honor of uh, what everything this country stands for. And so, Father, we do thank you for this great act of sacrifice. And as we look out into the world around us, we, we notice great tragedy and pain. We note that the reason why we need soldiers to go and fight is because there is real evil in this world, and you've called us to oppose it. And, Father, we also notice other tragedies like the loss of a loved one with uh, ben and Vicki Ward and Vicki's sister, and we just pray that you would keep them in your hands and uh, give them the encouragement that they need and the peace through your spirit, Lord, knowing uh, that you are in control of all things. And as we consider these conflicts and tragedies and sorrows that this world is full of, we know, Father, that only you can provide the, any real answer. And so we thank you for the goods that you've given us in this world that point us to you. We thank you for... Um, marriage proposals and upcoming weddings, Lord, and the, the, the great celebration that that is and how it reminds us of your goodness in uniting us together in love. Father, we thank you that uh, you've given us good things to remember, like Remembrance Day, uh, to remember the great sacrifice, but also the goods that we value as a country and as Christians even. And so, Father, this morning as we step into your presence for worship, we pray that our hearts and minds would be renewed on your truth, that whatever pain or sorrow, or perhaps even the good things that in life that could distract us, if anything is taking our heart and mind off of you, help us to look heavenward. Help us to see that you are on your throne, you are in control, and it's to you that we offer this time of worship and praise. So, Father, we pray that our hearts will be right before you and that you'd be glorified and honored in what we say and do now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, good morning again, church family. It's great to be with you. I ask that you join us in singing as we uh, set our minds on who our God is. We're going to sing Rock of Ages. 
Yes, I Will, and Behold Our God. And these are songs that are hopefully going to encourage us and challenge us that we can serve God and to love him wholeheartedly just as he loves us. Let's sing together these songs of praise. There is no rock, there is no God like our God.
kids video at this time. Jeroboam was the king of Israel. One day he started thinking, if the people of Israel want to worship God, they have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in the kingdom of Judah, where their old king, Rehoboam, is ruling. Maybe the Israelites will start thinking of King Rehoboam as their leader. That was not what Jeroboam wanted. So Jeroboam made two golden calves. Then he made an announcement to the northern tribes. It is so inconvenient for you to travel all the way to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, he said. Look, these golden calves are the gods who brought your ancestors out of Egypt. You can worship them. What Jeroboam did was a sin. Those calves did not lead God's people out of Egypt. God led his people out of Egypt. Jeroboam also built forbidden shrines and celebrated made-up festivals so Israel would seem like a better place to live than Judah. Jeroboam led all the people in worship to the false gods. One day, Jeroboam was standing by an altar to make a sacrifice to a false god. 
God sent a prophet from Judah to share a message. The prophet said that a son named Josiah would be born into the family of King David. He would bring judgment on the priests who make sacrifices to false gods. King Jeroboam pointed to the prophet and shouted, Arrest this man! But suddenly, Jeroboam couldn't move his arm, and the altar next to him broke into pieces. Help! Jeroboam told the prophet, Pray and ask God to heal my arm. So the prophet prayed to God and God healed Jeroboam's arm. Still, Jeroboam's heart was hard and he did not turn from his evil ways. He continued to sin by leading the people away from the Lord. Because of this sin, Jeroboam's kingdom would one day be destroyed. Sin always leads us away from God. Jesus came to bring us back to God. Jesus is the true king who gave his life as a sacrifice so we can be forgiven of our sins. Jesus' kingdom will last forever. This can be dismissed for junior church, the kindergarten up to grade three. And so they can go and enjoy a Bible lesson over there. We're going to get into God's word ourselves here this morning. And so as we do, why don't we bow in a word of prayer and we'll just prepare our hearts to get into what God has to say to us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning, we again thank you for your goodness and the many ways that we see it manifest in our lives. Uh, most importantly, though, through your son, Jesus. And it's him who we're looking to see and uh, understand more this morning as we open up your word. Even though we're dealing, of course, with the Old Testament book of the Bible in 2 Samuel, we, we do pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself, reveal the plan of your son and your desire to deliver your people to us very clearly this morning and uh, help us, Father, to receive from you and to return back to you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open them up to Psalm, or Psalm. Yeah, it's, we, we are going to actually kind of deal with a Psalm this morning. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22. And you'll understand maybe why the slip of the tongue in just a moment. What we're dealing with this morning is one of David's psalms or songs that he records and that the author records for us here in 2 Samuel. And that might sound a little bit odd because the vast majority of the songs of Israel and David are recorded in the book of Psalms. Uh, but here we have one kept for us, edited here in 2 Samuel because it serves us very well. Again, at the end of the book of 2 Samuel, we remember from last week, one of the things we mentioned was the last four chapters of the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 21 on, they're meant to give us a snapshot or a concluding idea about the kingdom of David and about how God would use it. And so here we have a song of David. It was given likely sometime after um, God had delivered him from the hand of Saul and maybe David was just being inaugurated as king and David writes this kind of song. In any case, this song is not, of course, in chronological order. The song was not written at the end of David's life, but was likely written somewhere in the middle of his life. Uh, and so here at the end of 2 Samuel, we ask the question, what does a song of deliverance help us understand about our God, about his kingdom, about his people, and about our need to return praise to him? And so this morning, as we think about the song of deliverance from David, Two major thoughts or two aims that I have. Usually I only have one aim, but this morning I have two aims. The first one is that we would have our hearts and minds renewed on the truth about God's character in delivering his people. That our hearts and minds would come to see and recognize that God is a God of deliverance. But then secondly, we want to be reminded of our need to respond in praise to God, just as David responded in praise and worship through a song like this as well, and many others, of course. So this morning, what I'm going to do is read through the entirety of Psalm chapter 22, and I know that's 51 verses. It's going to be about four and a half minutes of reading. I timed it, actually, earlier. I know that can sound a little bit tedious, but remember this. God's people have always come before Him under His Word. And so, yes, the reading of God's Word can sometimes feel tedious, but it is God's Word, and we are meant to receive from it. And so let's do just that. Let's keep our minds focused on that as 
we do read through this lengthy passage of Scripture. So I'm reading from the ESV, and you can follow along and just listen if you'd like. Sometimes the Psalms or the songs of the Bible are best just to be listened to. But if you really like to follow along in your copy of God's Word or the words on the screen, again, please do that. So starting in verse 1. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompass me, the torrents of destruction assail me, the cords of Sheol entangle me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy, thick clouds of gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the merciful you show mercy. With the blameless man you show yourself blameless. With the purified you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trained my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. Those who hated me, I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as head of the nation's people, whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me as soon as they heard of me. They obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be the rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and show steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Who is this God? 
who David served, who David worshipped, who David came before and praised, who wrote songs, who humbly repented, who sought God for help in every area of life. Well, the God we're looking at this morning is a God who brings deliverance. And so in the song of deliverance, I think there's a lot we can learn, but we're not just meant to learn from a song like this. We're meant to feel the same worshipfulness and be drawn into the same heart and attitude that David had as well. That's part of what the Psalms are meant to do for us, not simply teach us theology, but draw us into the same kind of worship that David had as well. So let's talk about this God, the God of deliverance, and we'll make a few points of application near the end. And what I've done is I've divided the text kind of into five parts, and I'm going to focus on a couple of key verses. We're not going to pick apart every verse, of course. The last Sunday, I did a lesson for our small group, and the Apostle Paul was in Troas. He, uh, he gave a long sermon, and it went from 7.30 till midnight. And by midnight, a young man was sitting in a window, and he fell asleep and fell out of that window. Well, the Apostle Paul went down, raised him up from the dead, and he didn't call it a night. He went back up and he started preaching some more. And Luke says he prolonged his speech. <laughs> he spoke for a long time, all, to, all the way till morning. We're not going to do that. Second Samuel 22 could probably be preached for a long, long time. But what I want to do is take out some of the key verses, draw us to the major sections and parts, and uh, hopefully see the kind of heart David had as he was worshiping God. So the first thing we notice right from the beginning the God that David calls upon is a God who hears. Look what it says in verse 7. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. See, if deliverance is going to happen for God's people, for David himself, we need a God who actually hears and pays attention to us. We wouldn't be drawn into worship. We wouldn't be drawn into songs and hymns like this. If our God didn't pay attention to us whatsoever, we would be praying and worshiping a God who's far away and unconcerned. But that is not our God. The God we see clearly throughout the Bible and here in 2 Samuel 22 is a God who hears and listens to the cry of His people. Sometimes this can be hard for us to grasp because we live in a world where so many people don't listen to us. Or maybe we've grown up with childhood trauma and we had an absentee father who didn't listen to us. Or maybe you yourself know the pain and the, the work of an overworked parent. And you know it's difficult to always listen and hear everything. Well, our God is not an absent father. He's not an overworked parent. It's not as if he doesn't have time to listen to us. He does. Uh, nor is he a corrupt public official who's choosing to do things only his way with no regard for the people under him. He's not an aloof celebrity who we have no access to. Nor is he a sordid pastor who cares not for the flock, but only his own personal gain. God is a God who listens. He hears. So David knows right from the beginning, the God who I cry out to in my distress, this rock, this fortress, my deliverer, he actually hears the voice of his people crying out. God hears the voice of his people crying when they cry out in distress over loss of a loved one. God hears the voice of his people when they cry out for help. We're getting married. This is a new stage of life. God hears the voice of his people when they cry out over the conflict and loss of life and violence overseas. God hears the voice of his people when they're struggling to bear the burdens of everyday life. We have a deliverer God who hears. Secondly, though, we have a God who is able. He's actually able to do something. He's powerful. He's equipped. And since he's the creator of the universe, he's able to intervene. He doesn't just hear our cries and wonder, oh, well, I hope they work this all out in the end. He's a God who's able, and he, and he does intervene, and he has the power to actually intervene and help us in life. Verses 8 through 16 talk about this God who is thundering and roaring and mighty and powerful in heaven. And when you come across those verses, we're left kind of awestruck and in wonder, well, this is the God that David paints this wonderful picture of. He's roaring and thundering up in heaven when he hears that the words and the cry of his people come to him. 
He's acting. He's going to shake and move the heavens and earth to come and rescue his people. And so look what it says in verse 14. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High utters his voice. Now David isn't just writing these things to be flowery and poetic in his writing. He's writing these things to remind us that we have a powerful God who is like no other. So we would go on in verse 11 to say, He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. I did earlier this week have half a mind to just preach verses 8 through 16. I thought, wow, those verses, they could stand alone and we could, you know, fill the entire time just looking at this powerful, thunderous God from heaven who kind of comes and moves heaven and earth to come to see and rescue his people. But then I, I went and spent the day with Dan Johnson. And many of you know Dan, he's the church planter out in Port Dover that we're partnered with. I spent the day with him at a conference on Tuesday. And I just so happened to go to a workshop that was put on by one of the professors from Heritage Seminary. And he was a professor of Old Testament, or he is a professor of Old Testament, and he does specific studying. His PhD is in studying the Psalms. And one of the first things he said in the workshop was he lamented the fact when pastors or worship leaders get up and they read a Psalm maybe on Sunday or do a, a, a reading before the congregation, and they only pick and choose some of the verses from the text, and they leave out a bunch of other ones because they're a little bit maybe, uh, they're a little bit harsh sounding, or I don't know if we should read about God destroying and smashing down the wicked on a Sunday morning. Well, maybe we'll leave those words out. And, and so uh, Professor Barker was lamenting the fact that so many preachers and, and worship leaders leave out portions of the Psalms because they don't like how they sound, and they just read kind of the really nice, beautiful, or, or um, culturally appropriate parts of, of the Psalms. And so after I, on Tuesday, heard that from Barker, I thought, well, I can't leave out any of uh, Psalm, or, uh, 2 Samuel 22. We're going to read it all. We're going to look at it all. God is a God who is able. For deliverance, we need a God who is able. No other God would do. Can you imagine praying to a God wondering, is this God able to actually help me in my distress? That's not the kind of fear or worry that God's people need to concern themselves with. Now, yes, God may choose to help us, in mysterious ways, he may choose to withhold certain kinds of what we might think are the most appropriate helps. He might do it only in his time and in a way that we don't completely understand. But make no mistake, our God is able. And when we do cry out to him, we can know with full confidence this is a God who can and will and has moved heaven and earth to rescue his people. And he can do that for me as well. God is a God who hears, a God who is able. He's also a God, it says, who delights in righteousness. So verses 17 through 31, uh, David kind of transitions his thoughts now as he's explained. God hears everything we say. He's able to respond and help us and deliver us. But the reason he responds to the words of his people, the cries of his church, are because he delights in righteousness. His church, the righteous church, he delights in moving heaven and earth to come and rescue and help us. But look what it says in verses 20 and 21. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. Now, some of you would rightly pause there and say, wait a minute, David. You? He rescued you because of your righteousness? Because of the cleanness of your hands? Verse 23, all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not turn aside from. You, David, didn't turn aside from any of God's statutes? Seem to remember a healthy portion of 2 Samuel committed to the portion of David's life where he did turn aside from the statutes of God and break God's law. So how can David say that God hears my prayer even as a sinner? And David says, well, I'm a righteous man. Well, not always, David. And that's true, he wasn't. And we as God's people, as we cry out to him, we would hopefully be a righteous people, but we also know 
we stumble and fail and fall, and we are sinners as well. And so we are not perfectly righteous. And we might wonder then, well, how can David make these claims, and how can I make these claims? In other words, the question that I think we need to answer is, who exactly are the righteous? Well, the New Testament helps us a lot in this regard. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, we read, the righteous shall live by faith. Faith. Faith in Christ. Faith in the trustworthiness of our God is the starting point for righteousness. Not simply good works, not just trying to modify my behavior to do the right thing at the right time, but faith in who Christ is as my Savior. This is the beginning of righteousness. The righteous shall live by faith. That means that if I seek to accomplish anything outside of faith, even if it looks good, even if it seems to match up with God's law, if I'm doing it from a place that is not faithful to Christ, it is not righteousness. It's, in fact, sin. The Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. The Apostle John would remind us, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Keeping His commandments, though, flows from a place of truly knowing Christ and believing Him and having faith in Him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So who are the righteous? Well, the righteous are those who have faith in Christ. They don't have a righteousness of their own. They're not boasting in themselves. They're not saying, well, I'm the one who's done everything perfectly, God, so now you've got to come save me. No, David knows that even God is the one who gives him his own righteousness. Look what it says in verse 25 of 2 Samuel 22. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to uh, my cleanness and his sight. God is the one who comes and he rewards according to the righteousness of his servant. But where does that righteousness come from? Does it come from David himself? Does it come from us? Well, look what 2 Corinthians tells us about where righteousness comes from. True righteousness. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's Jesus. He made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him, or to say it another way, by faith in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Not a righteousness of our own, not that we cling to our own good works, but to the righteousness made available to us by Christ. God delights in righteousness. Not in our own, or not in our own behavior modification, Not in us simply, well, I'm afraid that God might punish me, so I'm just going to try to do my best to do the right thing, but I don't really love God, and I don't really like doing those good things, but I'll do them anyway because I know I'm supposed to. No, whatever proceeds from faith is good and righteous. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If I have faith in Christ, then my good works are righteous, not because I've made them righteous, but because Christ has given me His, and then I'm living in His. So God delights in righteousness. The church is considered righteous before God, and not because of us, but because of what Jesus has done. So we can pray in the same way that David prays, God, deliver us. We are your righteous people. Oh, of course, God knows the ways I've sinned. He knows the way you've sinned. So he knows that you're not making that claim on the basis of your own perfection. But when you pray, God, deliver your church. Do good to your church. Bless your church. Because we are a righteous people, we're saying that, making that claim, because we know Jesus has given us his righteousness. Your son paid for us. Your son died so that we could be righteous in your sight. So God, act. God, deliver me because of the righteousness you've given. So God delights in righteousness. He delights in a church that would strive for doing the right thing in his sight. For deliverance, we need a God who is able to make us righteous by the work of Jesus and to sustain us in that righteousness. So God hears, God is able, He delights in righteousness. Fourthly, this deliverer God, He is a God who is preeminent. Preeminent. Verses 32 on through 46, a large, large chunk. I believe what David's doing in those verses is he's explaining just how great God is. I know he's already kind of done that 
You know, back in verses 8 through 16, we have this warrior God who's flying out of heaven. You know, most kings back in the ancient world, they would sit on a chariot when they went out to war and they would have regular horses. Now, mighty steeds nonetheless. But can you imagine the image David's giving? My God, the king who's coming to rescue me, he's on a chariot and he's being pulled by what? Cherubs, these fierce, angelic, heavenly creatures that were often depicted in the ancient world as lions with the body of a lion, the head of a lion, and massive eagle's wings. My God is roaring and thundering out to battle for me, being pulled by these fierce and ferocious heavenly creatures, the cherubs, flying on the wings of the wind. But David's already talked about this massively powerful God but he's also now going to refer to God in a slightly more nuanced way. Verses 32 through 46 is going to talk about the preeminent God. Not only is he able, not only is he powerful, but he's the most powerful. In fact, he is the only true God. So verse 32 says this, For who is God but the Lord? And in English, it's kind of a little bit tricky to see the power of what David's saying there. Kind of just sounds like what David's saying is, who is God but God? Oh, okay, David, uh, God is God. Yeah, we, we get that. But no, what David's saying there in the original language, and in some of your Bibles, or hopefully most of them actually, the word Lord is all capitalized, capital L-O-R-D. And that's a very significant um, statement that the author is making, because in English, the capital L-O-R-D actually stands for the proper name of God for Yahweh. The name of God that the people of Israel knew back in the ancient world. So David is saying, who is God? Yahweh is God. He's not just saying God is God. He's saying there's one name, there's one God, not all these other gods of the nations, not all the other pagan gods, not the gods of the foreigners. There's one God, but the Lord, God Yahweh. And who is a rock except our God? He is preeminent. The word preeminent means um, greater or above all. The word preeminent means surpassing all others. And in the Latin, the word preeminent means towering above. This idea that God is towering above all else and there is nobody else who can even touch him for his power and glory and might. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 talks about God this way. Jesus this way, I should say. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In other words, God has revealed his preeminence, his towering above the rest through the person of Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus did in his death on the cross, resurrection, and then rescuing us from sin, all of the work of Jesus reminds us that we serve a God who towers above the rest. He's preeminent in every way. And so David is going to describe it. Now, David didn't know Jesus, of course. He didn't know that God is manifest, of course, as a triune God. Not yet, anyway. God didn't reveal that to his people just yet. But David knew that the God, the Lord God, Yahweh, there was only one God, and it was him. And he stood far above everyone else. So he goes on to talk about how foreigners would come cringing to him in verse 45. Verse 46, foreigners lost heart. They came trembling out of their fortresses. Uh, down in verse, or up in verse 42, they looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. All of the other nations around him, they looked for help from their gods and maybe even from the God of Israel, but there's no answer. The God of Israel is on Israel's side. The God of Israel is going to thwart all of their enemies and push them back and rescue David. The foreigners come cringing before David because they realize none of our gods can help us. So we need to serve David and David's God. God is preeminent. He's a deliverer who is over all. And for deliverance, we have a God who towers above everything. Jesus then is the representation, is God who is preeminent. He's the only way for deliverance from sin and death. And when you consider, well, what do we need from God as a deliverer? We need him to deliver us from sin and death and the power of sin and brokenness 
in our own lives. The only one who can do that is God, Jesus. Then we pray as David prayed. Who is our deliverer? Who is the God who can truly rescue me? The Lord God, Yahweh. And the church then says, Jesus is his name. So we have a God, a deliverer who is preeminent. Lastly, we have a God who is praiseworthy. Verses 47 through 51, David concludes the song here by simply praising God. Thanking God for being who he is, being the God who delivers the rock, who's exalted above all else. And he goes on in verse 50 then to say, For this I will praise you, for his delivering power, for his great might, for his preeminence, for the fact that he listens, for the fact that he acts, for the fact that he's able to actually rescue us. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Let me break that phrase down into a couple of smaller parts. He says, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. And David isn't just concerned about God being elevated in his home or in Jerusalem. He wants the Lord God, Yahweh, to be elevated among even the pagan nations who didn't know God yet. And so David knew that his purpose and the purpose of the people of Israel was to draw others to the one true God, and to be able to recognize the glory and goodness of God. So he says, I praise you, God, not just amongst your people here in Jerusalem and Israel, but I praise you among the nations, that they might know there is one true God. And God was setting Israel apart, and he was protecting and delivering David so that the other nations would know the power and glory of the one true God. So he says, I praise you among the nations. Then he says, I praise your name. Again, there's only one name worthy to be praised. David does not ever seek to praise any of the other foreign gods. He doesn't mix in that worship with his own worship of Yahweh. He doesn't ever, and David was one of the few kings who never mixed pagan worship with the worship of, uh, of the one true God, Yahweh. He never thought to himself, well, God is delivering me pretty good right now. He's been pretty good to me. But what if he stops helping me? Maybe I ought to pray to some of these other gods and the nations around me just in case. Kind of hedge my bets. You know, don't invest everything all in one place, they say. You ought to kind of have a diverse portfolio. So maybe David could have treated God that way. Well, I know God's kind of the big God, but maybe I'll just kind of look for help from the other ones as well. Just in case they might be able to help when God can't. Well, David never does that. Even when David was suffering the consequences and punishment of his own sin, he never turns away from God. He never thinks, oh, well, praying to Yahweh didn't work this time, so I'm going to go to someone else or somewhere else. He constantly prays to God. And in Psalm 51, which we went over earlier in the summer, we are reminded that even when David was suffering to the consequences of his sin, he responds by turning to the one true God and seeking repentance and forgiveness. So God and God alone, the one name, Yahweh, is worthy to be praised. So then we consider for ourselves, who are the nations for us? As we praise God, and as we are called to praise Him for our deliverance, we're reminded that when we praise Him, we're not just simply praising Him for our own sake, or for the sake of the church, or for the uplifting of the church. We praise God as an act of evangelism, as an act of sharing the light of who our great God is. So among the nations, among the nations of our world, among the people nearby us. We consider Canada kind of a melting pot of many different backgrounds, traditions, nations, all coming together in one. Who are the nations for us? Well, many of them are all right here. It might not feel like that here in the small town of Waterford, of course. Who is the world? Who are the nations to us? Well, everybody in our world, but also those who God has put right nearby us. When we worship God, we are being a light to the nations around us, saying, this is the one true deliverer. This is why we worship him. Who is the name we elevate? David elevated the name Yahweh, the only name that could save. Well, we know that name now is the name of Jesus. And yes, we can still pray and use the name Yahweh. That's a perfectly good name to use. God revealed himself as Yahweh. But he's also revealed himself to us more specifically as Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior God who's been sent to deliver us from sin 
And so as we pray in the same way David prayed, we elevate that one name, the name of Jesus. So our God is a deliverer who hears us. He is able to save us. He delights in righteousness. He is preeminent and he's praiseworthy. Let me give you a couple of points of application then as we kind of come to the end of the message. One thing to kind of know all of this about the song in 2 Samuel 22, well, what do we do about it now? Well, first of all, the Word of God always does this for us, and the Psalms and the songs that we find in the Bible especially help us with this. But we need the Bible to inform us of the identity of our God. The Bible informs us of the identity of our God. God's given us the Bible to reveal exactly who He is. And so when we read such a powerful song like this in 2 Samuel 22, we're meant to think, okay, the Bible is telling me something about my God. And the reason I need to know this about my God is because, well, well, first of all, we are prone as people to forget where our help comes from. And this can happen also quickly in life. Things might be going well, but then all of a sudden um, something happens in life that's unexpected and things go the wrong way that we didn't expect to happen or God gives us something that maybe we don't like initially and we're so prone to forget, well, our help actually comes from God. Let's keep worshiping Him, honoring Him, lifting Him up and relying on Him. There's so many daily temptations, I think, in life to trust other powers, to trust other kinds of gods, and we might not call them gods, but we elevate them as the thing that could potentially deliver us or help us. Or maybe we look for deliverance in our own strength or through our own power. So we're prone to forget where our help comes from. We need the Bible to remind us over and over again that God is our help. But you know, then secondly, we need the Bible to inform us of the identity of our God in order to guard against the lie that God is not a God of deliverance. Now, this is something you might think, well, Christians would never think this way. Christians would never believe that God is not a God of deliverance. But wait a minute. As we allow the Word of God to hopefully convict and challenge our hearts, have there been times in your life when you've wondered or worried or even believed, I don't know if God's going to deliver me out of this. First of all, In our world, there are so many voices in our world that want to tell us the God of the Bible, He's not who you think He is. He's just this mean tyrant seeking to control and keep people under His rule and reign. And yes, He is going to keep us under His rule and reign, but He is certainly not a cruel tyrant. I think there are so many voices in our world who want to describe the God of the Bible in ways that are just flat-out lies. And if we're not careful, we'll be tempted to believe, man, maybe God is like that. Maybe God doesn't really care for me. Maybe He's too busy with other things. Maybe the concerns, worries, burdens, pain, and turmoil that I'm going through, maybe God is not at all going to intervene to help. Maybe it causes us to not even want to pray to God. And maybe we feel like when we pray, Our words are just going up into the air and not being heard by Him at all. There's so many voices in our world that I think would seek to deceive us into thinking that God is not a God of deliverance, and that's just not the case. And so we need the words of God here. We need the song to tell us and to remind us, especially in verses 8 through 16. God is a God who thunders. God is a God who comes to... The light in His people, the righteous. God is a God who will judge the wicked. God is a God who does care about what you're going through in life. He's a God who's able. He's a God who listens. He's a God who's praiseworthy. And He's a God who's able to come and sustain you in life. So we need the Word of God to inform us daily because we're so prone to forget and we need to be on guard against the lie that God is not a God of deliverance when in fact He certainly is. So application number one, we need the Bible to inform us of the identity of our God as a God of deliverance. But application number two, we are created to be a people of praise, 
to our God. We are meant to be informed and knowledgeable and believing in a God of deliverance, as this song shows us. But the next thing we do with that knowledge is, well, we praise God. We're created to be a people of praise to our God. See, praising God and worshipfulness when we come before God, even on a day like today, but throughout the week, this is where God's people were meant to derive their joy from. The joy of knowing God as our Savior. That God is the joy of our salvation. We, we don't derive our joy from the other goods of the earth. We derive our joy from a God who delivers. So when God's people come before Him in worshipfulness and in praise, we're responding to a God who delivers and we're, we're worshipfully telling God, God, we want to take our joy from you. We know that there are other things in life that are good. We know that some of these good things you meant for us to return praise to you in. But God, you are the one who we ultimately want to derive our joy from. God, you are the God who strengthens us. So in worshipfulness, in praise, my mind and my heart is going to be turned to the truthfulness of your word and who you are as you've delivered me. And I am going to receive strength from that. God is my strength. I'm going to receive sustenance, nourishment for my life and my faith through praise. And, importantly, I'm going to be a witness to a lost and dying world of what God's people were saved to do, what God's people were meant to do with their life. Praise Him. And yet God's given us vocations, jobs, other earthly purposes to engage in in this life. But all of those come under the umbrella for a Christian as my purpose is to worship and praise God. That's my identity. And yes, the church is meant to be on mission, evangelizing, spreading the gospel. Yes, the church is meant to be doing ministry, serving. But our identity is subsumed in all of these acts as an identity of people who worship and praise God. I think many people in our world, they... They devote themselves to finding goods. Goods that belong only to this world. What I mean by that is we pursue the treasures of life. We pursue the goods of this world as if they themselves are the only goods available to us. And I think sometimes we're tempted and we do this as Christians as well. We pursue goods of this world as if those goods are the lasting goods. But what God is revealing to us again and again in His Word, and particularly here in 2 Samuel 22, the goods that God has for us are ultimately divine goods. The Christian is meant to be pursuing those divine goods. You were created to receive those divine goods from God. Where do you think you can receive those divine goods? In worship. Yes, God's given us children, those are blessings. Yes, God's given you purpose in a vocation. That's a blessing. Yes, God's given you purpose in serving Him in a church like this and in evangelizing people around you in your workplace, in your neighborhood. That's a blessing. Those are good things God's given you. But you are meant to find the goods that only God can give you through this kind of worship and praise that, that can only be done by His people in His presence. The goods that God has for you are divine goods. They cannot be derived anywhere else in life. Those divine goods are what you are meant to be pursuing. So worship God, even as David has. We're created to be a people of praise to our God. And then may the God who delivers us, and as David has praised God in this song, may he teach us the identity of himself as he delivers, and may he instruct us on how to worship him. For he is a God who is worthy of our praise. Heavenly Father, as we come before you in quietness of prayer, we ask that you would fill our minds with truth. Help us to understand how great and powerful and majestic you are as a God who delivers us from evils, from sin, from Satan, from despair. But Father, we pray that you would inspire and move in us 
this desire to worship you, to return praise and thanks, that we would derive our joy, our strength, our sustenance, and our witness for you from the act of worship and the act of praise. And may we be known as a people who uh, worship you as a God of great deliverance, that others might look in upon us, the church, and see us even as we go out into a world as people who are overjoyed and grateful and praising the name of Jesus as someone who's delivered us, as the only one who can provide that deliverance. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please join us in the singing of How Great Thou Art? Father, as we leave this place, we do pray for your grace and mercy to go forward and be that light that you've called us to be. Help us, Father, to have hearts of worship and praise uh, regardless of our circumstance. In times of lament, help us to turn to you. In times of pain and times of abundance and joy, help us to remember that you are worthy of all of our praise. You are a great God who has truly delivered us from the power of sin and Satan and has come to deliver us even from brokenness in this world. So, Father, help us to be reminded of your greatness in our everyday lives and in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. God bless.